this is going to keep things kind of lively and we can have a little bit of discussion and um, yeah, let's talk about sex. <laughs> um, yeah, there's my disclosure again. So yeah, we're going to explore some changes and challenges with sexual activity and intimacy after stroke and learn how to address sex and intimacy with patients and their partners over the course of this talk. So um, I want to start us off with another vignette. This is um, Fran. So Fran is a 59-year-old woman who sustained a left hemisphere ischemic stroke six months ago. She's being seen in outpatient clinic for follow-up. The good news is she's regained most of her gross motor function in her right upper extremity, though fine motor is still a bit more difficult for her. She continues to experience some expressive aphasia, but has also made good progress there. Her provider sees this and says that Fran is doing really well, to which Fran says she knows she should feel good about where she's at recovery-wise, but she just feels blah, gets easily fatigued. She feels like everyone, including her husband, acts like she should be back to her normal self, but she just doesn't feel that way. She adds, and sex? I don't have a lot of interest, and I really feel it's hurting our relationship, and we don't talk about it. I have a hard time finding the right words. The provider feels uncomfortable and unsure how to follow up to this, and instead changes the subject to ask about how she's doing with ADLs like dressing, and whether she's thinking about going back to work. This is not an uncommon scenario, and we often hear that our patients would like more information about sex and intimacy after stroke. But it's not something that's typically talked about for various reasons. I hope that the information that I'm gonna share with you today will help shed some light on factors involved in sex and intimacy after stroke and how to better address this, these issues with your patients. So I wanna kinda of start off with um, thinking about some common myths that um, you might have held or someone you know might have held um, about um, uh, sex and intimacy after stroke and in pe persons with disability. So persons with disability are not interested in sex. Persons with disability are not able to function sexually. Persons with disability don't, a person with disability doesn't have the capacity to behave in a sexually responsible manner. If the patient is not in a relationship, the topic of sex does not pertain to them. Check yourself. So why does this matter? You know, we've talked about mental health being a big issue, right? We talked about how many of our patients are affected um, functionally in other ways. Um, Stroke affects sexuality in more than half of our survivors and can lead to many sexual difficulties like erectile dysfunction, loss of vaginal lubrication, or a decrease in desire. But it's not just about sex. Acquired physical and mental impairments may significantly alter, yet do not eliminate basic sexual drives or the human needs for affection, intimacy, and a healthy positive self-concept. So over the course of kind of the first half of this um, talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the physiological correlates and the psychological correlates um, related to the patient's stroke that can also um, uh, affect co-occurring issues with sex and intimacy. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about the physiological correlates. The most important sex organ, it's the brain. And I hope I convince you of this by the time I'm done with these next couple of slides. So here's just a list and a figure of the areas of the brain act that's activated during and after sex. As you can see, there is a lot going on. Um, there was one study um, on, in women that found that as many as 30 areas of the brain are active leading up to and after orgasm. That's impressive. <laughs> So let's look at this in more of a play-by-play -play overview. And I'm gonna cheat here and, and read my notes because <laughs> there's a lot here. 
Um, so you can see here this, this figure that shows sort of this play by play going from expectation to consummation to satiate, satiate the after. Um, <laughs> Um, this particular brain, um, the, the images here are um, from a male brain. So we're going to start off with desire. Desire starts with sensory input or cognitive processes. There are a number of regions of the brain that kick in when people feel sexual desire. As might be expected, several of them are in the temporal lobe the limbic system and cortical areas. Feel free to refer to your brain hats. I think these might come in really handy. I just wish we had stickers that kind of corresponded to some of these things as well. That'd be fun. Um, one of those regions, the amygdala, orchestrates powerful emotions. It is a part of, circuit, of the circuit that is thought to be responsible for pleasurable feelings. The amygdala has been implicated in processing mental aspects of sexual arousal in adults. So it helps us evaluate a stimulus as arousing or not. So in the desire phase, the amygdala has selected the incoming sensory information as very critical and worth noticing. Aha! This might be interesting to us. Another, the hippocampus involved in memory consolidation and information integration, may become active as we associate certain sights and smells with past sexual experiences. All of this leads to sympathetic nervous system activation, which peaks during orgasm. After orgasm, the parasympathetic nervous system is activated and slows us down to normal again. But the sexual experiences are not just a matter of primal emotions and associations. Some parts of the brain that light up in fMRI scans include regions that are associated with some of our most sophisticated forms of thought. The anterior insula, for instance, is what we use to reflect on the state of our own bodies. So things like being aware of that feeling of butterflies in your stomach. Brain regions that are associated with understanding the thoughts and intentions of other people also seem linked with sexual feelings. Finally, the nucleus acubens is the pleasure center of the brain. Anything that is pleasurable will activate the nu nucleus acubens as dopamine, we all know dopamine as a neurochemical messenger that's associated with pleasure, reward and reinforcement, flows into this area and gives this message. That was fun, it felt good, tasted good, smelled good, whatever. Don't forget, do this again. This provides reinforcement to repeat the behavior. So I hope you can see from this very brief and sort of consolidated overview that all areas, or areas all over the brain, are um, involved in sex. It's no wonder then that if you have an insult to the brain, like, an, uh, like a stroke, that sex and intimacy might be affected. So let's talk about how um, different types of stroke locations can impact different aspects of sexuality. Again, this is kind of a, a Summary um, certainly doesn't cover all of the nuanced details, but typically we can think about, you know, a stroke happening in the left hemisphere might be associated more with hyposexuality, so kind of a lowered um, uh, sex drive. Um, a lot of this is maybe due to depression, for example, which um, is also more associated with left hemisphere stroke, as we um, talked about uh, earlier today. On the right hemisphere, you have um, more of the hypersexuality, where um, there we have the loss of inhib inhibition and regulation. Front of the brain lesions are associated with motivation to engage in sexual activity, decreased sexual arousal, the ability to initiate sexual activity, and so on. Whereas in the rear, um, there's more um, of the understanding of language and ability to communicate that might be impacted. In addition to the actual stroke itself, there are also a number of health factors that can impede sexual functioning. So issues with blood supply or blood flow as seen in conditions like atherosclerosis can affect blood supply to the sex organs. Hormonal changes like reduced testosterone or thyroid hormone may also reduce sex drive. As you may know, many of the conditions are risk factors and are often comorbid with stroke. So these are things we might want to keep an eye out for. Then there's also bowel and bladder issues that are um, common after a stroke, um, sometimes resulting from the stroke itself. 
Um, and patients tend to report this as being a particularly bothersome um, or impeding their interest and ability to engage in sex. And of course, I would be absolutely amiss if I didn't also mention depression as um, being a major contributor to um, problems with um, sex and intimacy. Um, reduced libido is one of the hallmark symptoms of depression. And so this might also um, feed into this. I don't know if you can see or read the text here, but it says, you know, it has an image of the brain, knows exercise, socializing, sex, and leaving the house helps depression makes you too depressed to have the energy to do any of them. The other thing that's um, important or that can sometimes come up is this fear of having another stroke during sex. Um, there is a very low likelihood of this actually happening. Uh, the American Stroke Association um, basically states um, on their little info page that it's, you know, sex or the act of sex um, is about as exhausting or um, takes about as much energy as walking up one or two flights of stairs. So you might have increased heart rate and things like that, but that's absolutely normal. So um, it's very unlikely. However, if this concern comes up, it absolutely needs to be discussed with the provider. Okay, and finally, just like when we talked about this in the um, depression talk, we also need to think about medications that might contribute to sexual dysfunction. So um, beta blockers, for example, um, antidepressants, neuroleptics, anti-epileptics are all linked with various degrees to some sexual dysfunction. And so, you know, it's really important that we pay attention to that or make note of that if that is um, something we're concerned about or if our patients are concerned about, um, you know, decreased libido or disinterest in sex. Okay, so now we're going to move on to kind of more of a, talking about sexual relationships and intimacy. So sexuality is a natural part of life. Um, it consists of physical, psychological, and often spiritual components, right? And it's more than just the behavior of sex. There are things like um, masculinity and femininity, a sense of worth, desirability, and affection that are all part of sexuality. And what about intimacy? I think we got this to work this time around. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you all, um, how do you define intimacy? We had a test run here. We got a starting point with fun here. So if you could, um, and also if you're watching this remotely, I believe you should be able to complete this as well. Go ahead and scan that QR code and just type in some things that feel right to you. It's working. I want to get rid of that little thing in the middle, but I'm scared of touching anything. <laughs> So some of the um, biggest words here are closeness and connection, safety, exciting, love, the ability to be vulnerable. Reset my brain. <laughs> I 
I love that there's so many different ways uh, that we define intimacy. Thank you. Human touch is in here too. That's nice. Yes. <laughs> so intimacy is really the ability to create and sustain um, intimate re relationships. It's really essential. Um, there is intimacy with and without sex. Whenever we talk about intimacy, we're talking about a range, right? It goes anywhere from spending quality time, verbal expressions of love, warmth and closeness with and without touch, all the way to physical intimacy. So there is a whole range. And I think that's really important when we're thinking about um, our patients and their partners. Um, in a study that was done on intimacy factors um, for couples after stroke, um, these were some of the things that were tightly um, intertwined or related to intimacy, like unconditional, unselfish love, being present, communication, a commitment to staying and working on the relationship, being understanding, um, having a solid pre-injury relationship foundation, being grateful for survival, spending time together, social supports and family bonds. So what gets in the way of intimacy? Um, I've shared a slide similar to this in previous talks, but these is, this is kind of a smattering of things that we've heard um, both patients and their partners um, say to us um, as they're talking about you know, some of their um, hesitations, some of their questions, and some of their worries and fears. Things like, my body doesn't look the way it used to. I worry I will have another stroke. I'm not sure I can perform. I feel unattractive, I'm being treated like a child, I'm unable to provide for the family. I don't know if it's okay for us to have sex. I need to constantly keep an eye on you to keep you safe. Your personality is different. I had to get a second job to support us. I feel like a parent, not a partner. All of these things get in the way of intimacy and sex. Let's kind of dig in a little bit deeper here. Um, changes in roles within couples um, is really common following a stroke. Um, really, there can be new roles, right? Like taking on the, the role of a caregiver, um, reassignment of household tasks. There can be role losses or reversals. For example, the primary provi provider is no longer able to work. Um, the change in roles that's uh, probably most relevant or most disruptive in many ways to couples specifically or romantic couples is the change that can happen when you move from being partners to a caregiver-patient relationship. Now, importantly, oftentimes early on, right, this is absolutely a necessary thing. They might be the person the partner might be the person who can really help support them, take care of them, do a lot of the medical things that they might need to um, have support with um, early on in the recovery. But it can often get in the way when that's how the relationship stays. These new roles are often dissonant with sexual and romantic roles because they take on more of a um, caregiver patient role. If we're thinking about um, the stroke survivors themselves, um, self-image can really play into sort of their self-view and how they experience um, their own bodies themselves and how they view sex and intimacy and how confident they feel in that. Um, you know, changes in body function, body image, and self-esteem can all occur after a stroke, which interferes with sex and intimacy. Stroke survivors may not feel attractive and perceive their bodies as fragile, unfamiliar, and unreliable. Changes, these changes can lead to shame, frustration, and depression for both the stroke survivor and the partner, which hinders sex and intimacy. 
So it's definitely more um, than just about the physical function, right? We can see that um, there are more factors in play. On the other hand, how the partner perceives the stroke survivor can also affect sex and intimacy. So there, these are just some, some examples. Um, the partner may be bothered by some of the effects um, of the stroke. Um, there's also like a solid body of literature out there that shows that partners tend to have a more negative appraisal of the survivor's physical and cognitive function. Um, this mismatch can often leave um, the partner feeling overprotective and overly cautious, parental, if you will, and the survivor feeling misunderstood and frustrated. Neither of these sentiments are conducive to sex and intimacy. And then, of course, we have um, this big issue of communication and cognitive impairment. Um, conditions with cognitive impairment and aphasia are among the most difficult for couples to navigate. For one, a partner might seem like they have a completely different personality, uh, which can also transform the relationship. Um, communication is really critical to intimacy. And so if that is impeded, then that's going to create some problems in terms of um, sex and intimacy, um, although there are ways around that. Um, one partner may lose sexual interest or experience guilt or maybe even resentment about their own unmet sexual needs. And sexual desire often remains intact despite loss of cognitive ability. So even if you have someone who has cognitive impairment, don't assume they're not interested. And that's where maybe some of, the, some of the problems might come. Inevitably, when I give talks on sex and intimacy after stroke, I get questions about this issue of mutual consent. How do you know if someone who's had a stroke and they have cognitive impairment, that they're able to provide consent, right? That they understand or know what they're doing or, they're, or that they're giving consent to what's happening. Um, there's kind of two things or two common scenarios, if you will, and that the stroke survivor may be either painfully aware of, you know, the, the, the issues they're having or they might lack insight into their impa impairment. They present different problems, but they're both challenging um, to handle. And I wish I had a magic wand and a one-size-fits-all response to this problem this question or this problem, but I don't. Um, this is one of those really difficult things to navigate. It's a fine line um, in terms of making sure um, that, you know, yes, there is, you know, consent. This person knows, um, you know, and understands. Like, they might be interested in sex. They might not be interested in sex. Either way, they, you know, they're an adult, right, presumably. Are they able to make the decision to do this? I mean, it, it gets really, really messy. Um, communication in all of this is key, and that includes communication with the partners, between partners, as well as with providers. And again, this is one of those reasons why I think it's so important for all of us to have this on our radar. We need to understand that sex and intimacy are ADLs right? <laughs> we should all care about this. Um, and so, it, you know, it's not necessarily something that we can just pretend doesn't happen. Um, providers should be on the lookout for concerns of abuse. We know that um, people who have um, disabilities that includes cognitive impairment are at higher risk of, of being abused, right? So there is this, there is this um, potential for for um, abuse that we need to be on the lookout for. Okay, that's the not so, f not so fun part about sex and intimacy. So with that, you know, how do we actually assess and treat this? So there are recommended approaches to sexuality and health care. Sexuality is a valid health issue that should be addressed in all clinical settings. As I just mentioned, it's an ADL. We should all care. We should all have a part in this. Um, sexuality should be dealt with in the same manner as other important issues in health care. Health care providers play a vital role in accomplishing this mission. You know your patients intimately, both physically and emotionally. And this rapport is absolutely a therapeutic tool. 
Addressing sexuality is part of the best practice guidelines in stroke rehabilitation in several countries, including Canada, Australia, and the United States. We should all be doing it. So what are some barriers? What, um, why might you not bring this up with your patients? And I'm going to throw this out to you all, the audience. Another adult is present. So are you referring to specifically kind of a privacy issue? Okay. Yes. Say that again? My own insecurities. I might be embarrassed to bring it up. You might be embarrassed or insecure about how to bring it up. Absolutely. Yes, so being, being the opposite sex. So maybe there might be more comfort if it was like a woman-to-woman -woman conversation or versus having, you know, maybe being a woman and talking with a man about their um, sex and intimacy issues or questions. Can, can you say that again? I didn't hear. They don't currently have a partner? They don't currently have a partner. Yes. So single stroke survivors are definitely not having sex. I'm, ag I'm agreeing with you, by the, way, by the way. I think this is one of those things where it's like, okay, if they have a partner, maybe this is something that's going to come up. But if not, maybe it's not something we need to worry about. kind of a taboo subject they don't yes. talk about it yes absolutely absolutely so with older stroke survivors this might be somewhat of a taboo to topic right I think in terms of disability as well right if someone is disabled it's kind of a taboo we don't want to talk about it it's not happening absolutely cultural and religious biases Lots of reasons why we don't bring it up. So I have a, I have a list here. Um, you know, there's often a lack of clarity about whose role it is as well. PT might feel like this is not really something that is in their wheelhouse, so, you know, we're going to pass it on to psych. <laughs> That's common, commonly what happens. Um, not putting this on PT, but <laughs> it's like calling psych is really one of the, the main... Um, referrals. There can be just a lack of knowledge and confidence in this. Like, how do you do this? How would you address this? Would I be equipped to even responding or, you know, troubleshooting some of the questions that they have? Being uncertain about whether anything can be done. Fear of offending the patient or making them feel worse about their condition. A lack of time. Man, who has time to like, oh, this is, you know, it's a lot to take on. And again, like we, we already talked about the assumptions. Patient might be older, doesn't have a partner, stigma about disability, and the cultural and per personal biases. Um, all of those um, barriers are kind of based on presumptions um, that could potentially be um, overcome through things like planning or really thinking about this a little bit. Um, so hopefully that's kind of what we're doing here today. So here are some common myths and misconceptions. Um, again, you know, you will offend a patient if you talk about sex. If the patient doesn't bring up the topic, it must not be an issue. You will offend a patient if you talk about sex. It is best to let a patient initiate this topic. And there are no effective intervention methods. Another one um, that's common is that, oh, that's something that can be handled in outpatient or that's, you know, should be done in outpatient um, rather than like inpatient setting. Misconceptions. Okay, so where do we begin? Um, really, you know, some of the, the key things here, they feel a little bit Duh. Um, but I think it's important to, to remind us all, right? Maintaining an honest, open, and professional approach is really important here. Don't apologize or act skittish when bringing up the topic. If you're uncomfortable and awkward, chances are they're going to feel uncomfortable and like, oh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say anything about this. 
um, and ensure that you're properly educated about how stroke impacts sexuality. You know, your job is to facilitate health promotion, remediation, modification, overall health and wellness, and sex and intimacy are just part of that. And be aware of your own biases. If you feel that you can't have these important conversations, make sure that you utilize another member of um, the patient's treatment team who can. That's provided there is someone else on the treatment team who can do this. So for starters, um, you know, if you're doing an interview, you should begin with kind of a general inquiry and move into more sensitive areas. So it's kind of like that gradual sort of warming up approach. Um, you can use bridge statements to incorporate sensitive or difficult topics into an interview. So for example, to what extent are you satisfied with your sex life? Has anyone talked to you about how your stroke can affect your ability to have sex or be in a sexual relationship? Since your stroke, has your relationship with your partner changed? Do you have concerns about your safety or communication with your significant other? Has your libido or interest in sex changed? So I think it's really important that, you know, as I'd mentioned, like kind of intimacy happens on a range, right? And a patient might not necessarily be interested or ready to talk about these things. Um, it's kind of their level of, you know, interest and ability um, to be engaged in sex and intimacy is going to differ or kind of range from, you know, depending on where they're at to where they're going um, progression wise. Um, but I think it's really good to start bringing those things up early because it signals that sex health is important and that it is safe to talk about these things with you. Right? So that if in the future this becomes something that they do want to talk to you about, they know, oh yeah, I remember. Um, they, you know, Alex, she talked to me about, you know, whether um, I'm having any issues in my, you know, intimate relationship with my partner, and now I have questions. So they feel more comfortable coming back to you later. So again, kind of the, the message here is that. This doesn't just happen once and done. This should happen over time. So check in every so often. You don't have to like obsess over it because that might be weird, but um, really check in. <laughs> so, um, you know, it seems like, it seems I, I really have to give a shout out to the organizers because I feel like there's been these common themes woven throughout all of these presentations and I swear I had no idea when I put this, um, these presentations together, but I feel like we've really played off of each other nicely. Um, you know, you can use assessment tools um, to get at some of this. Sometimes it's a little bit more comfortable to give someone a questionnaire to fill out. Um, and then you look over it and you say, oh, I see you marked, you know, that you are um, having some issues with uh, your bodily appearance. You know, let's talk about that. Um, so I wanted to give you some different examples of assessments that are available. So there are a lot of um, quality of life measures, so kind of broad measures that include questions specific to um, sex and intimacy. So this one is just an example from the quality of life after brain injury questionnaire. There are many others out there. Um, the promise um, measures, uh, there's just lots and lots of options there. I just pulled a couple here. Um, this, this one is on, uh, let's see, interest in sexual activity, and then the other one is on satisfaction with sex life. Um, there's various male and female specific sexual function scales as well, so there's lots and lots available there. There's a sexual interest and satisfaction scale and changes in sexual function questionnaire. And then again, female um, and male sexual function um, indices. Um, these are just a range, a range of um, questionnaires that are available. So there's no shortage of assessments if you decide to do something like that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about evidence-based treatments 
um, for, for this. Uh, there was um, kind of a, a large review that came out on structured um, sexual rehabilitation programs um, that really found that there was solid evidence um, for two main models, one being based on the plicit model, which I'll talk about here in just a second, that's kind of the, the visual up here, and the other being pelvic floor muscle training programs. So these are the most supported by evidence and are actually the most promising interventions for use by allied health professionals. And unlike what we um, might be might be kind of the more typical situation, at least in the systems that I was part of or that I am part of, that intimacy and sex questions are referred to psych or similar, um, the programs um, that were that were part of the study um, were not necessarily meant to be administered by one single profession. Um, the administrators were physicians, nurses. Um, they talked about specific roles for PTs and OTs. Um, that were highlighted, not just um, with regard to like the pelvic floor muscle training, but also for training clients in um, things like bed mobility, positioning, um, and sexual counseling. So again, we can all play part in this. So the plicit model um, of addressing sexual functioning, who's heard of this before? A few of you, okay. Um, so this, uh, this was created basically as a structure for healthcare workers when addressing sexuality in a clinical setting. Um, and it, it's designed to kind of go from, um, you know, kind of the giving patients permission um, to raise sexual issues. So kind of like a very, I don't want to say shallow, but it's kind of like that, you know, more maybe a safer space for most of us um, to address is these issues with patients all the way to intensive therapies. So again, it starts at permission where it really gives patients permission to raise um, some of these sexual issues with you. And oftentimes that is enough for patients. They might just have questions and they want to ask you, they want to maybe just voice some concerns that they're having and that's all that's needed. The kind of the next step is this limited information where you're giving patients limited information about kind of maybe sexual side effects of certain medications that they're on or really kind of more specific information or in a limited scope about, um, about some of their questions. And then we have, you know, specific suggestions that's more intense, making specific suggestions based on a full evaluation of presenting problems all the way up to intensive therapies, and this is where you would include, you know, psych intervention, sex therapy, and or biomedical approaches. So there is this, this full range. I also um, have this example of a sexual rehabilitation intervention model that I thought was really nice, um, just because it shows some of the very specific things that you might address as part of this. Um, you know, information regarding changes in sexual life after stroke, general information regarding a healthy sex life, and so on. I'm not going to go into, into the details here, but you should have this available in the slides. And then, of course, um, there are people in this room who are way more qualified to talk about this than I am because I am not a PT, but, um, you know, I did mention that pelvic floor muscle training is one of those evi evidence-based um, interventions for, um, to treat uh, sex and intimacy issues. So I'd encourage you to check that out or talk with someone. Um, or I think I included um, in my list of resources and references um, uh, uh, one of the studies that um, talked about this specifically. Okay, but we all really want to know how to apply this, um, you know, in a practical sense. Ooh, I'm running out of time. Um, so what helps? Um, I'm gonna try to be concise here. Um, when we're talking about um, partners and stroke survivors having difficulties with um, some of those role changes or kind of going from you know, being a romantic couple to um, caregiver patient roles, um, there are some, uh, some solutions here, like hiring someone to assist with care, especially bathing and toileting, working with OT to assist with strategies for dressing and toileting. We know slight modifications may greatly increase functional independence, plus resumption of sex can be a great motivator to become more independent. 
Um, there are um, other things like you know, redefining selves as individuals and as a couple. Um, so activities such as watching a favorite movie, listening to music, spending time outdoors, or enjoy enjoying a special meal together can really enhance um, that sense of intimacy, reconnecting as a romantic couple. Um, I pulled some quotes here from our restored intervention because that, this is exactly what, what our restored intervention is designed to do. Um, so one of those is, you know, we get along pretty well. We've known each other for 23 years and I've always loved her, but after the stroke, it was hard to express myself, and I would get super frustrated, especially about the things that I care deeply about. Um, the next few slides, and I'm going to kind of go through these fairly quickly, um, are really more like practical uh, yeah, practical applications, and I will say that um, uh, I did not put these together. This was actually provided by my um, one of my for former PhD students who is also a licensed occupational therapist. Um, and so she put these together for me for when we presented this together at a different conference. Um, but positioning is definitely one of those things um, that can be really important, you know, uh, um, you know, if, if your patient is affected by dizziness, can't lie flat, for example, you can prop up with pil pillows. Um, in terms of spasticity, um, you know, this can be really frustrating for patients who are trying to engage in intimacy um, because it restricts movement, it can cause pain, right? So there are some different tips here where you can plan around medication times, lying on the spastic limb and bending it slightly, um, providing gentle passive range of motion, you know, definitely talk with OT or PT for training on this. Sensation changes, also really common. Um, so maybe try using a TENS unit prior to engaging in sexual intimacy. So again, get proper training from PT or, to, or, or, ah, or OT prior to using. Trying massage, engaging in relaxation techniques. Managing bowel and bladder, right? We talked about this at the beginning of this um, presentation. So things like using the restroom prior to engaging in intimacy. Um, have the patient lie on his or her side to reduce pressure on the bladder. Lubrication and AIDS. So there are a lot of different options for this. Um, there are a variety of things like sex toys, um, aids that patients can buy both to add in sex with a partner and also for masturbation. I did include some website resources. Um, these are specifically for um, sex aids uh, that can be used um, uh, for individuals with disabilities. So they have like, um, uh, like adaptive, adaptive handles and things like that. And then the environment is also really important. We talked about how there's just a lot that happens in the brain, right? The sex involves a lot of stimulation. Even a healthy, active person without a brain injury can readily admit that sex engages pretty much every one of our senses to an extreme. Our brains are already running on conserved energy, and I remember worrying that I was going to stroke out the first time I had sex after my brain injury. My heart was racing out of control, my head was pounding, I was dizzy, my entire body hurt, and all the while I was trying to make sure my partner wasn't aware of the hell going on inside my head. Even going out to eat at a loud and people-filled restaurant is a major undertaking with all the background noise and lights and people talking. Is there any wonder that having sex is just too much for our brains? And so um, modifying the environment you know, to decrease stimulation can also be really helpful. Keep, it, keep the TV off, dim lights, reduce background noise. Apathy and fatigue. Um, you know, teaching things like energy conservation techniques, choosing a time of day when the patient has energy, um, engaging calming activities prior. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of have you think to yourselves or maybe later after this, um, about the factors that we want to think about if we were to see Fran in our, you know, in our clinics. Um, what questions what might we want to ask? Are there any clarifications we need? And what might be some suggested treatments? Um, I did include um, handouts and websites as part of your um, 
uh, as part of the, <laughs> my brain is <laughs> shutting down slowly, um, <laughs> as part of the uh, handout that I put together. And so I just wanted to share this one more time with you all because, um, you know, I know several of you have heard about this study now a few times, and um, I wanted to kind of touch back with you and let you know about how our, some of our couples are doing, specifically when it comes to this connecting with each other, which is our module on sex and intimacy, or also it covers um, sex and intimacy after stroke. Um, we have um, several of these activities um, that we suggest to kind of encourage um, the, you know, the intimacy piece, kind of reconnecting with their partner on a romantic level. We also include things like um, uh, worksheets and resources. So the I hope, I want, I need worksheet, for example, is one that, um, that they can use. And then some of the things that participants have said, we, you know, we have now a lot of um, participants that have actually completed the entire program, including the six-month follow-up. And so we come back to them and ask them, you know, what, what has been your experience um, being part of this study? So this is like nine months after they first started the program. Um, these are some of the things we've heard. You know, just to say thank you for allowing my wife and I to participate in this great program. I have had many health issues over the 25 years of marriage, and prior to participating in the restored program, my wife wasn't as compassionate or understanding towards me. I appreciated that this program addressed the sexual component in a relationship. Too often, ableism and infantilization cause people to think stroke survivors and disabled people more broadly just aren't or shouldn't be having sex. Changes in ability, appearance, or sensation post-stroke can change how or how often one engages sexually, and that's worth addressing. Finally, thank you. My partner is not afraid of me or seeing me as damaged. Oh, and the sex is great. <laughs> um, so yeah, you've seen this before, you all have the flyers. And I think we maybe have a few few minutes for questions. I think we're right at the hour. I'm happy to take questions or you can email me, reach out. I think you know where to find me by now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.